Cool. Well, welcome again, everybody. I'm really happy that you all decided to come out tonight, especially on a Saturday. We really, really appreciate it. In this class, what we hope to do is give you a foundation that you can start your uh, trading career on, or if you're already an existing trader, refine some of those technical analysis skills, which you may need to. So the first thing that is a foundation of technical analysis for most traders is going to be candlestick charts. And to start off, we're going to go into candlestick anatomy. In technical analysis, the most commonly used chart is the candlestick chart. I'm sure you all are very familiar with this chart. And in order to understand these charts, we must first break down and understand candlesticks. Candlesticks have a data set that contains an open, a high, a low, and a close value for each time period that you want to display. Candlesticks represent a period of time. I'm sure you've seen our technical analysis in the uh, Discord, and you've seen sometimes some of our traders are using 15-minute charts. Other times our analysts are using four-hour or daily charts. There's all different time zones you can pick, and each of them represent that time period. So let's go farther into the anatomy of these candles. The hollow or filled portion of the candlestick is called the body. Just to highlight it, this is the body. Also referred to as actually just the body. Some people refer to it as the real body, but nevertheless. The long thin lines above and below the body represent the high and the low range and are called the wicks. So here are the wicks. Right here, right here, right here. Essentially, what happened for this candle is this is a bullish candle. You see the candle opened here. It may have moved down here, formed this wick, but let's say this is a 15 minute chart. It came down here within that 15 minutes, up here within that 15 minutes, but at the end of the 15 minutes, we closed here. The beginning opened here, and the 15 uh, minutes later, the close was here. So there are two main types of technical analysis which are used, naked trading and indicator-based trading, also referred to as mechanical trading. The main differences are in naked trading, there's no indicators used, there's a heavy reliance on price action, and it is mainly discretionary, meaning that you're coming up with most of the setups and there's not a mechanical-based checklist or system that you're following, but more trend lines and support and resistance fractals, etc. And in indicator-based trading, obviously, indicators are used. It's very mechanical, and my way of looking at that is if this, then that statements. And it also can utilize checklists. I personally util utilize checklists for most of my systems. So let's first go into naked trading. Naked trading refers to te technical analysis that does not utilize indicators and rather allows traders to determine a trading hypothesis and an actionable position. Naked traders enjoy using support and resistance lines or support and resistance zones, also referred to as fractals, Fibonacci levels, trend lines, and candlestick patterns. So, in determining structure in naked trading, it can utilize a lot of other tools that we will touch on shortly, such as support and resistance fractals or lines, as I just briefly stated. Having an understanding of base level market structure skills is a requirement for diving deeper into how the market truly works and therefore moves, allowing you to capitalize on those moves. So, further into market structure, we're going to look at impulse and correction, uh, corrective waves. So, Impulse, also known as motive waves, are the waves in which a market is moving at an increased pace. I want you to imagine that there's more volatility in impulse waves than in corrective waves. In a later section, we're going to go through some examples. In a bullish impulse wave, as an example, buyers are forcing prices higher, overpowering sellers at the current time. In a bearish impulse, the opposite would be true. So imagine there's a lot of volatility and a bullish impulse wave more buyers are rushing into the markets and overpowering sellers. I hope that's easy to understand. So let's go into corrective waves. Corrective or retracement waves are the waves in which the market is pulling back and accumulating new orders to prepare for the next wave, or is where there's a lack of decision amongst buyers and sellers. We also refer to these as indecision in the market or consolidation. After a bullish impulse wave, prices will consolidate or push lower and there is decreased momentum, and candles are smaller with a lack of volatility. So, let's go through some examples. Here's a first chart. I want you guys, just given the descriptions, to kind of take a guess as to what you think these uh, waves are. I'll give you a hint, right? So this is one type of uh, move, this is another move, this is another type of move, and then this is another move, as well as this one. Each uh, predecessing um, wave count in this is going to be a different type of wave. 
So I'll give you one more second to kind of guess as to what wave is which. And also just to interject real quick, um, I am also sharing my screen. Turns out there's a maximum number of viewers per screen. So if you can't view Logan's, um, start viewing my screen. And if there are any other issues, let us know in live chat, VC mute or in free chat. And we'll see if we can fix it as soon as we can. Please let us know. Um, Jacob, make sure that there is no overlap of audio, by the way. Nope, I don't think there is. Cool. So here are the labels. This is an impulse wave. This is a correction wave or corrective wave. This is an impulse or a motive wave. And this is a, uh, another impulse wave right here. And this is a corrective wave. So let's go through as to see why that is. A wave is a corrective wave until it breaks the high or the low of the prior wave. So as you can see here, I added in the lines which show you guys this is where, right here, where this wave becomes an impulse because we broke the low of this last corrective wave. And then this line right here is where this wave becomes an impulse because we broke the high of this prior wave. So we're in a correction until we break the high or the low of the previous wave. Moving on from impulse and corrective waves, we're going to look at support and resistance lines in this example. Very briefly stated, support and resistance lines are specific price levels that have been rejected or supported by market participants. So in this example, we have three touches right here. This will be a um, support line, as you can see. And right here, we have a resistance as it was touched one, two times. Right here, we have a resistance line, which then broke above and became support. In this example, we have four touches to the support line. As you can see, this is just based by wicks or by bodies, whatever you prefer to use. And in this example, we have one, two, uh, two touches before we break up. And then this would become support at this point because we broke above prior. So the more tests a support and resistance line has, uh, the more accurate the price level. The ways to trade support and resistance lines are retests and rejections as well as breaks and retests. And we're gonna go into some examples right now. So right here is a break and a retest. Sorry about that. As you can see, we broke above. This was a resistance line. And then it turned into support where we then came back down, confirmed this level of support, and pushed off very strong with an engulfing candlestick, which shows that this level is holding. As you can see, we then came down farther and retested this level even more. This is a retest and a bounce off. I hope that makes sense. The stop loss, if you were going to take this trade without any other confluences at all, the stop loss could go below the last break below the support because once that level breaks, the idea is invalidated. In this example for take profits, we're using um, tr trend-based Fibonacci extensions. Here you can see we have a bounce off of this uh, resistance line, which then entered our trade. So our stop loss goes above the high now because we're selling short instead of buying long. And we bounced off of this level and came down with another strong bearish candlestick. As you can see, we bounced around a little bit more around this level, retested one more time, and then had a very, very strong bearish candlestick, which hit our take profit level. Our take profit level in this instance was used measuring a support line. As you can see, we have one touch here and one touch here. This could be used by measuring a support fractal from here as well. It would have been yielding a slightly lower risk to reward trade, but you get the idea. So in this example, we're going to go into support and resistance zones. These are specific price levels that have been rejected or supported by market participants, very similar to support and resistance lines. The difference between um, lines and zones is that for zones, I measure them by large wicks that have not been preceded by two candles to the left or to the right. As you can see, we have a large wick. Look two candles to the left. No wick is surpassing the high of that wick. Look to the right. Same thing. So this is a confirmed resistance fractal or resistance zone. They're the same thing. Same thing right here. Two to the left. No wick surpasses this low right here. And then two to the right. Same thing. So here is a, another example. As you can see, our support zone or fractal stretch right here. Measure our two wicks. Nothing breaks this low. Two candles to the left or to the right. We form the zone. As you can see, we test it many, many times. Another one time here, one time here, 
one time here. Right here, we tested the entire zone and moved strongly off, as you can see. We had a very long wick, which went right to the bottom of that fractal, worked out very, very well. Bounced around a little bit more, and a little bit more here. As you can see, these can be very, very reliable for measuring support and resistance. Same thing right here. Two candles to the left, two candles to the right. This is our fractal. Same kind of thing. Retest here, retest here, retest the entire zone, and bounce off. Just letting you guys know, I do not measure um, zones being broken by wicks, as you can tell from this example. So let's move back into this. The more tests, same thing as a support resistance line. The more tests, the more accurate and strong the price zone. And the same way to trade the uh, support and resistance zones is the same way to trade as the support and resistance lines, being retests and rejections, as well as breaks and retests. So in this example, we have a break above this resistance zone, a retest. As you can see, I highlighted this in green for resistance and then red as support. Once we broke above, this then turns into support. Very, very clean retest of this level and a bounce off. Stop loss as well can be placed below the low. Um, I placed it above the or below the zone in this example because we broke off the zone clean when I took this entry. Take profits in this example are used um, by trend-based FIB extensions, which we will go into very, very shortly. Here is another example of a bounce and re, um, a bounce trade. Sorry, and as you can see, we bounced off this, confirmed as a support again after one test, two test, three tests entry on this trade. Take profit was placed at the high or the extreme of this resistance fractal on the high. So let's move into trend lines. Almost every single trader has learned or is actively using trend lines. Even with that being said, not every trader knows how to use trend lines correctly. Some traders do not include wicks, some traders do. There's some personality in that. I'm going to walk you through how we use trend lines at OBR. So a trend line is a line drawn over pivot highs or under pivot lows to show the prevailing direction of price. The question is, what really are trend lines? Trend lines are just a visual representation of support and resistance in any time frame. They show direction and speed of price and also describe patterns during periods of price contractions. So we will be drawing our trend lines from the wicks of candles and we will be looking for a minimum of two tests of the trend line, either support or resistance. The more tests a trend line has, the stronger that support or resistance ha uh, is, same as the zones and the lines that we spoke about previously. Trend lines on top are considered resistance and trend lines on the bottom are considered support. Hey Logan, real quick, just make sure that when you're moving your mouse, make sure it's on the one you're sharing to us because it's really helpful for people to see exactly what you're looking at. Absolutely. Yeah, you can see it now. Cool. Thank you. So here, as you can see, we have a top line, trend line drawn over two touches. And in this example, this is a resistance line because it is on the top. And as you can see, we had a, another retest here and a break above where you could have taken an entry on the breakout of this price pattern. As you can see as well, we have two tests to the tuck, uh, to this lower support line, which is our lower trend line and is support because it's on the bottom. Here's another example, as you can see, one touch, two touch, three touch. The more touches, the more um, confirmation that trend line has, obviously. So again, three touches on the lower support bound of this price pattern. And we broke above, same thing as before. In this example, we used a resistance line as our take profit. So enough with trend lines and support and resistance. Let's move into the juicy stuff. This will be our introduction to Fibonacci. Fibonacci retracement levels are horizontal lines on your chart that you draw from the left to the right, from the top or the bottom of a wave to the end point of that wave. If that was confusing, we'll have some examples. The percentage is how much a prior move the price has retraced. The Fibonacci retracement levels that we use are the 23.6 level, the 38.2 level, the 61.8, and the 78.6. I'm sure you may have heard, if you're familiar with Fibonacci, the golden ratio, which is the 61.8. And the golden retracement zone, which we use as our primary retracement zone when we utilize Fibonacci retracements, is the 38.2 to the 61.8. We use Fibonacci retracements to show uh, significant or critical zones, which show us a retracement is more likely to end and reverse, and also to showcase take profit levels. So um, you can use Fibonacci tools, there are Fibonacci retracements, as well as trend-based Fib tools. 
Uh, mainly, we use trend-based Fibonacci extensions to find Fibonacci extension levels, which will be used as take profit points. So the differences between the two is that for Fibonacci retracements, there is two connection points. It is drawn from the top to the bottom of an impulse wave, and it shows retracement levels and extension levels. The trend-based Fib tool, on the other hand, requires three connection points that is drawn from a top to bottom of a wave and then to the bottom or top of the preceding retracement that occurs after the primary impulse wave. So we're gonna go into some examples right now. Here is just the Fibonacci retracement, not the trend-based Fib extension, but as you can see, we draw from the left to the right. As in this example, it is a bullish impulse wave, so we start from the bottom, which is our start point. We end it at the top, which is our end point of this wave. And then as I was talking about our golden zone, I've drawn a box to help label this for you. The 61.8 is the strongest reversal zone, but also this entire range is a great confluence for when a retracement may end and reverse and continue in the prior trend. As you can see, we're looking for a bullish trend continuation because we had a bullish wave followed by a corrective wave, which then we would be expecting another bullish impulse wave. In this example, we also are using uh, just Fibonacci retracement levels, same way we drew it before, a bullish impulse wave, bottom to top, left to right, start to end. Same zone is drawn, 38.2 to the 61.8. In this example, we're going to look at the trend-based Fib extension. As we were saying, it requires three connection points. The origin of the prior wave, which will be right here, our start point. The end of the previous wave, which is labeled by end right here. And then the extreme of the pullback, or the corrective wave which follows, which is right here. So when you draw it, you would click here, here, and then here. And then this pulls up the 61.8 extension level, as well as the one level, and if we went higher, the 161.8 level. This example is very, very similar. As you can see, we have three points of contact, start and pullback point. And as you can see, same levels are drawn. So now we're going to go into secondary indicator trading as we move away from the naked trading because not everybody primarily is focused on naked trading or discretionary trading styles. So secondary indicator trading, which almost every single analyst at OBR utilizes secondary indicators in their trading, but trading indicators are just mathematical calculations which are plotted as lines, dots, or shapes on a price chart and can help traders identify certain signals and trends within the market. Some examples of popular indicators that we use are moving averages, the most popular of those being the 21, the 50, the 100, and the 200 moving average, the parabolic SAR, which stands for parabolic uh, stop and reverse, the stochastics, the moving average convergence divergence indicator, which is known as the MACD, pivot points, and Bollinger Bands. So towards the end of this, we're going to touch a little bit more on market structure because that is what we mainly use for our higher time frame analysis. What is really important to understand is the market moves in ebbs and flows, and we refer to these ebbs and flows as waves, as we were speaking about previously in our impulse and corrective waves. Market structure, by definition, is the simplest form of price movement in the market and is the easiest to read. Um, it is basic support and resistance levels on a chart, which we uh, went over, swing highs and swing lows. And these levels are um, easily identifiable and hold until they are invalidated. To touch briefly on our primary way to monitor market structure, we're going to touch briefly on my love, Elliott Wave Theory. So Elliott Wave Principle is a form of technical analysis that looks for recurrent long-term price patterns related to persistent changes in investor sentiment and investor psychology. The theory identifies impulse waves that end up in a pattern and corrective waves that oppose the larger trend. Each set of waves is nested within a larger set of waves that adhere to the same impulse or corrective pattern. And I know that may be confusing, but we're going to just show you an example very, very briefly. Here is a framework Elliott wave count. It is a five wave motive move followed by a three wave corrective pattern. So this will be our motive move right here. Wave one, wave two is our corrective wave in this overall section. As you can see, we'll touch on this later in subdivisions. But this primary five wave move is our impulse or motive wave followed by a three wave corrective wave. Now, what is important to notice is that in wave 
1 to 5, wave 2 and wave 4 are corrections of the larger trend. But these are necessary because in all healthy trends, we have these retracements. So finding these retracements, identifying them, and being able to trade them allows you to set up perfectly to catch the next impulse wave. So that was just a brief introduction. There's more to Elliott Wave Theory in the OBR education section. But thank you very, very much for joining. This was just a taste of what we have to offer. This was our first call, and we are going to do more of these, absolutely, where we can go more in-depth on these topics. If you enjoyed, please let us know. And now I know it says time for questions, but first we're going to do some live ticker requests. So please start putting it into live uh, VC mute, whatever ticker request you'd like us to do. And all four analysts in here are going to do a top down A to Z analysis of the ticker that you put in. We're not gonna do too much, but we'll take a couple of the most popular. Tesla? Apple? Let's, let's start with Apple. Let's start with Apple. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to quickly. Yeah. Um, and, and do you just want to do it on, on your screen, uh, Logan? And then maybe we could just discuss it, maybe. Um, yeah, that's fine. Okay. That, that, that could work. Yep. Yeah. Well, the chart. Just keep in mind there's a max number of viewers per stream. So I'm just going to reshare your screen. Um, yeah. As you do it. Yep. Here's the Apple chart. So. I do have something drawn on here. This was actually invalidated a little bit ago, but I'm going to delete it and walk you guys through it all A to Z. So, I'm just going to lower my desk. So, so for most of these TAs, Logan, right, um, do you yes. want to stick to maybe perhaps a four-hour time frame, or you just want to kind of jump around and kind of just look at it from a few different angles? Let's do a top-down A to Z analysis. So let's start at the higher time frames and then move okay, down. Okay, let's do it. Let's do it up. So my first thing that I'm going to do is draw in my fractals, which are still prevalent. And I can see one right here, as you can see, we touched the, on this earlier, right? Left two and right two. No wicks precede this candle. So we're going to draw in this zone right here. As you can see, we've been testing the zone very, very nicely in Apple after we broke above. Just to help make it a little bit easier to visualize, at this point when we broke above, this then turned into support. Right, guys? Let's label it as green right now. So right now, let's take a look. I can see that there is... A lower bound support line right there. And let's see, we had a higher move. So let's look at our Fibonacci retracements. Wrong tool. There we go. So in this wave, if we are done this wave, which is quite debatable. Oh, wow. Look at this chart. Okay. So I see what you mean by staying to four hour. I can see how it might get confusing if we go to higher time frames. Well, I, I mean, I was just thinking, right, because the object, it's going to, you know, I don't know. It, it's all the same necessarily, right? Because your, your technical analysis can be applied in fairly similar ways regardless of the time frame. But, you know, maybe just to keep everything consistent, we could stick to some, you know, similar time frames. But it doesn't matter. Definitely. So yeah. the one thing that isn't worthy noting is, is actually something we didn't touch on because we didn't go too deep in secondary indicator trading. But there is some divergence on the RSI. Divergence is a disagreement between a momentum indicator, in this example, it's going to be the RSI, and price. So as you can see, price is moving higher, but the RSI is moving lower. This is mostly used for reversals. That being said, do I think we are going to see a reversal in Apple? Well, I feel like the analysts might have a different take on this, but I feel like this move higher might have just been news related, and we're in a rectangle right now. So we're in a bit of consolidation. And if we're going to look at Elliott wave counts, take a look. See where this wave is expected to end. Actually, that's perfect. Wow. <laughs> that's funny. It's funny how TA works out sometimes, right? But as you can see, we touched our 161.8 Fibonacci extension level, which is an area which we use for profit taking. So in this example, this might mean that the trend is over and we might see a reversal. I'm going to lean towards a reversal in Apple due to the fact that we have that RSI divergence, we've reached the 161.8 um, zone. The only thing that's holding us back from a reversal right now is this strong support which we've been holding from this fractal. So if we get a break below, I'm going to expect Apple to at least come back down to this lower support line right here. Let's just touch that up again. And if we break above this consolidation and we break above this divergence line, then we could expect prices to move higher. 
That being said, I can't give a clear direction on Apple right now because we're in consolidation. There is indecision in the market. There's no clear determining factor of where we may, uh, may move. But here are some clear indicators of where we may go if this plays out well, right? So if we break below this support fractal, I'm expecting prices to go lower. If we break above and out of this consolidation period, I will expect prices to continue moving higher if we again break this divergence line. I really like everything you said there, Logan. And yeah, you, you know, you're totally right. It, it is kind of a coin flip as to where we're going to break out, right? Anytime you have an extended period of consolidation, especially in an uh, asset or sorry, excuse me, an equity of, of this market cap, right? It's, uh, you know, it could, it could go either way and it, it's going to be explosive, right? Uh, and it's interesting that you think that Apple is going to reverse, right? Because we were talking about this earlier with some of the analysts and we said that Apple might have a good fall coming up just because, you know, of some fundamental news. So uh, it will be interesting to see what happens when, you you know, it gets interesting when you have fundamentals playing against the technicals, right? The technicals look bearish, but the company is making big moves. So it's going to be interesting with Apple. And uh, I, I don't, yeah, it's not really certain as, you know, as to either direction yet. I'm not, I'm not sure which, which way we're going to go for Apple just yet. Yeah. Before we move on, Jacob and Bilu, any thoughts? No, I agree with basically everything you said. I think it's some beautiful TA as well. Um, as far as Apple goes, just sort of other things that we've been talking about, you know, it had its attempt at a breakout and then broke back in just from some other um, possible TA that we were drawing earlier in the week. So some other, some other people may have remembered us going over it in live calls. So I think this shows just another example of um, possible moves that we could see out of Apple. Um, but I do like more so the way that you're drawing it here from a daily perspective. And I like the addition of RSI divergence, even though it's not necessarily something we've gone over fully uh, in that presentation. It is a tool that we use very, very often. Yeah. So we could touch on that in our next call or in a live call. So I, I noticed there's a lot of different tickers being thrown. Do you think we could get some people reacting to some messages just so we can get um, some more votes on certain tickers so we can you know, get, get the ones that people want most? See, was for definitely once XRP. <laughs> <laughs> Did I hear XRP? Uh, Lucifer is screaming XRP. I see, <laughs> I see two votes for. Okay, so we got Nvidia. We got, we got some votes. You said Nvidia. Yeah, we got five reacts to that one. Okay, okay. Enough said. Perfect. I don't have anything on here yet. Okay, so we are at a critical point right now for Nvidia. Happy we're doing this. Right here, not exactly a fractal, but we can definitely draw in a line, which shows our previous high. I'm just gonna make this solid so you guys can see it a little bit better. So this is going to be our prior local high. And let's see if we can get a wave count. Oh, wow, yes we can. We obviously had a corrective wave right here where we had some consolidation. We spoke about this, hope everybody sees that. We had wave one, wave two, three, four, five, let's see this up here. Now, let's see if we can take off this box. So the retracement on NVIDIA is very, very close to what we would have wanted it to be. So I'm not going to invalidate this and say that this was not far enough of a retracement. It could have been better, but that being said, it's very, very close to that 38.2 level. So I'm not too worried about that. This does look pretty bullish to me right off the bat, because as you can see, we had this um, corrective phase right here, consolidation in the market, price then started trending, and I just love Elliott Wave Theory. I have a lot of confidence in it. Once you know the rules, it's pretty amazing what it can do. Um, so let me show you guys some price targets for NVIDIA. And this will utilize a tool that I talk about a lot actually, which is known as FIB clustering. We didn't touch on this in this call, but here's a prime example of a FIB cluster. You want to explain what they are a little bit real quick? Yeah, absolutely. So a FIB cluster is pretty much utilizing as many Fibonacci tools as you'd like um, to find an area where all of the tools line up. As long as you're using them correctly, then it will work out very, very well. So in this example, what I did was I took the uh, Fibonacci extension level of this third wave and got this level right here, the 127.2. And I also took the trend-based FIB extension from the low of wave uh, three to the high of wave three to the lowest point of that corrective 
move that happened for wave four. And as you can see, we have an overlap, very, very close overlap between the 61.8 level and the 127.2 level. So that would be my Fib cluster and my profit zone for NVIDIA. My main thing is going to see us break above this high. And once we can do that, I'm very, very confident we'll hit this level. Analysts, any comments? Nope, I agree with that too. Um, I just, you know, I, so I can't open up my own screen right now because I'm resharing yours because we've had this issue with people seeing, so I can't do my own TA on the side. Um, but no, I do agree with everything you've been saying here. In the video, I feel the same way. I think that the breakout here is, is you know, assuming it can get back above, is definitely going to be an extension of a possible uh, final wave. So I agree with everything that you were saying over here. Um, you could argue that we already did break out, but I'd want to see a push past. Yes, well, we did. Yeah, yeah we did. Yeah, yeah. Um, as you guys can see, just to touch on this really quickly, what Jacob was saying, um, we did form a price pattern right here by drawing our trend lines. As you can see, we were talking about this on the on the presentation. Two touches at least. We had our first touch right here, second touch right here for our resistance line. And as of the last daily close, we did break above this resistance line, confirming this price pattern. So we did actually already break above. That being said, there is still some resistance at that high. So it's a mix. <laughs> yeah, and I see resistance um, along the high of the third wave a good amount. I, I think generally that's where I see a good amount of resistance just following on the um, support and resistance section that you talked about earlier. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. We can definitely see that sometimes, majority of times. That being said, it will be interesting to see if that resistance holds considering we just got a breakout. Yeah. And um, another thing that I would add is this fourth wave correction. It didn't, it didn't retrace as much as we would like it to optimally retrace to the level. Sometimes the waves don't correct enough, and it's the debatable thing about Elliott wave is: would you consider it a fourth wave if it doesn't retrace enough? You know, because there are no um, set in stone rules to Elliott wave except for that there's one two three four five it doesn't tell you how long each of well, those one two three four five waves well, have to be yeah. correct well, so i, I could actually argue your point right here just to make things interesting go ahead the way that i know this was a fourth wave is because of the fact that we had an abc corrective move in that fourth wave so this was something that i didn't want to get into on the slideshow because this is something i can rant about for literally hours but what is known in sub, uh, Elliott Wave is subdivisions, and subdivisions is pretty much just Elliott Wave on a lower time frame. So in each five wave move higher, let me just draw it out for you guys really fast. I'm not going to do it too long, I promise. Brian got me on it. <laughs> um, so in this five wave move, in wave one, on a lower time frame, there is going to be a one, two, three, four, five wave move, right? So there's a five wave move within the five wave move. That being said, in wave Two and four, like I was saying in the slideshow, there's, uh, since these are corrective waves, we're looking for an A, B, C, right? So what do we have right here? In wave four, it obviously did not retrace as much as we would like it to, but we did have an A, B, C corrective wave, which means that this fourth wave did complete. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with what you said, Logan. And also, I do want to point out the thing, um, if we, how we were talking about those, um, those structural price patterns. Um, that you said that we did have a breakout from that, you know, symmetrical triangle or, or whatever, whatever, whatever you um, have it drawn there. Um, but did, I don't know if you mentioned the possibility of fake outs yet, right? Just because a trend line is broken doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to break that pattern and break out in a specific way, right? We can often see fake outs that go kind of against what we're thinking, you know? I don't know if you spoke about that. I didn't yeah. speak on it, but it's yeah. a great point. Absolutely. Just because of, I mean, obviously, right? Everything in trading is probabilities. So when you yep. do that, when, when you understand that, you know that support and resistance lines, support and resistance zones, it's all probabilities as well. Just because we got a breakout, and although this being a clean breakout, we are retesting resistance, right? We're still at this resistance level at this high. That means this might come lower and could re-enter this. Right, it could, right just, it could just start jumping right back around in there again for, what are we on? We're on a one day chart? Yeah. So NVIDIA might not see it's, you know, from a technical standpoint, there's a possibility NVIDIA doesn't see a breakout to either side in, until, you know, hypothetically until October, you know, which is kind of crazy to think about. So expanding on that, let's break yeah. it down to a lower time frame. We did break above and hold above on the one hour chart, but as you could see, 
we are definitely finding some resistance at this high. Right. It'll be right. interesting to see if this holds. But yes, fake outs are absolutely, absolutely, like, ab 100% a real thing. Well, you know, I was just thinking because, you know, there perhaps are some newer traders in here and, you know, a yeah. fake out, you, you have your lines drawn and you're like, oh, it broke out. So now it's time for me to enter. Right. And that could definitely be the case sometimes. But, you know, I've seen fake outs really, really mess some people up. Um, so, you know. And to expand on that a little bit more. Fake outs yeah. are the prime reason why I always am looking for confluences. You'll never see me take a trade just based on trend lines. It, it will never happen because trend lines do work 100%, but that does not mean they work all the time, such as fake outs. So what you need to do is find confluences. Confluences, I think the, the actual definition is multiple streams coming together that filter into one. Right, your, your fundamentals, your news, everything, right. right? It all comes together to help make a trading decision. Exactly. Confluences are just everything that you can find or as much reasons as you can find that confirm your bias. That doesn't mean have confirmation bias. You need to look at what's opposite of your bias as well. But if we're in wave four, we broke above a resistance line, we broke out of the resistance zone, we touched the reversal uh, golden ratio, then that's enough confluences for a trade, right? But just breaking above the trend line, I do not recommend that as a, enough confluences, nearly enough for just a trade. I hope that makes sense. 100%. Great point, Austin. Yeah. Um, Jacob, any, any notes? Brian, Bilu? No, I don't think anything else really to add. But yes, you're conf but uh, you know, just to expand upon the confluences point a bit, I completely agree with that. Um, you know, one big thing for me that I've gone over in live call many times is that I always wait for candle closes. Um, I know that in certain cases, like you do draw trend lines using wicks and I draw my trend lines using wicks as well, but I like to wait for candle closes for um, confirmation of a breakout, at least, you know, for initial confirmation. After that, though, I definitely want to keep looking at some of my other indicators or any other information that I have to sort of reinforce the idea that this actually was a breakout rather than um, not, you know, being a breakout or uh, possibly just being a little fake out move there. So, you know, don't make any trade just based on one indicator, one trend line, you know, one thing that you're looking at. If you're... If you trade with MACD and you see MACD cross, that doesn't mean anything if you're riding with like four lines of resistance right above you. So just be careful um, and definitely use as much information as you can during every single trade. Absolutely. So let's get some more reacts. I see we have three reacts to XRP. Oh, never mind. He reacted to his own. <laughs> Take a, let's take a look at XRP. All right, let's just, we yeah. need to please lose for gaming. Uh, I, I feel like, uh, wait, who's saying it? Lucifer Gaming? I would yeah. make Lucifer Gaming upset if we went into XRP talk. Yeah. I don't want to do that to him. Uh, we'll do that on a live <laughs> We'll save that for a live call. Me and Austin can battle for days. But um, yeah, so here's my chart, actually. This was actually a textbook play. So wave one, wave two, uh, sorry, wave two, wave three. And then we were expecting wave four to happen. Um, we're not actually getting that yet. We're just bouncing around right now. That being said, what is most likely going to happen, and sorry if you're trading this short-term Lucifer, is we're going to see an ABC corrective move and then possibly move down to this reversal zone here. Um, but as you can see, this was a prime example of subdivisions. I'm really glad you pulled this up, actually, and mentioned this, is because in wave three, I broke it down and showed you guys exactly how we kept... And by the way, this was not done in hindsight. This was done real time. Um, and that was being that, that's proven because this reversal zone was right here. Actually, we measured it in wave four, and then we had our fib cluster. <laughs> Look at this. We had our fib cluster right here, and that's exactly well, not exactly, but right below where we hit, right below where we hit. Um, so this was a great example of subdivisions, right? This is wave three of the higher time frame trend. We broke it down and were able to trade this on a lower time frame. And uh, yeah, that was that was a great example. But that being said, I do think we are going to see wave four play out on XRP before our next move higher. So Lucifer, if you're holding, I will not worry. I would say that, uh, you know, it just be patient. That being said, we did actually already retest the 38.2 of wave three. So it's, it's possible our wave four is over, but I don't think so. And then this will play out and then wave five will take us higher. Let's try to, we, we can't exactly get the trend-based FIB extension because we don't have a reversal point yet, but we can get the profit-taking zone on the Fibonacci retracement tool. So. 
My first day profit would be right here at $1.61, and then my second would be at $2.03. And, and anybody out there that's trading crypto, right? If you if you are interested in and you know investing is one thing, but trading crypto and, and looking for these short terms term moves in the market, um, you know, a good friend of yours, if you're trading these currencies, is not going to be you know looking at the actual the XRP chart. If you're trading XRP, is going to be really helpful. But what's also going to be really helpful to you is uh, the altcoin dominance chart, the ETH BTC chart, the Bitcoin chart, the Ethereum chart, right? So just to go along, right, with our technical analysis and just how to improve, right? If you are short term trading cryptocurrencies. Definitely utilize the other um, major assets in the 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 uh, the market because they're going to actually give you a really good idea as to how some of these these altcoins are going to move, right? And me and Logan talk about that all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Freeman wants us to go over a bearish pattern. Um, I mean, off the top of my head, I don't really know anything that I, I see this bearish right now. Triple a triple top is oh oh like like what is bearish about? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I didn't. I was maybe, just thinking about examples. Maybe take a look at at Baba just to see. Sorry for my background noise. And then maybe we can get QuantumScape up afterwards. Okay. Oh wow! Look at this. Take a look at the daily. Just trying to get a bigger picture. Okay. Okay. Get this going. I mean, I, it's funny because I'm not even sure how much longer I would be bearish in Baba. It's, we've been falling. That's, for, well, that's the point, right? It's like how I've been saying this for so long. How under, how oversold can these can these Asian Chinese equities get, right? In in this market, it's it's actually kind of ridiculous. Right now, if you bought Baba on the year to date, right? How long ago? Where's that first touch point? What's the date on that to the left that you have their, their first touch point on that? Yeah, yeah. I'm looking at your chart. Or am I not? Oh, am I looking at twenty seventh October? Hello? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yep. Yeah, the 27th of October, 2020. Right. So that's, that's you know, that's pretty crazy that things are kind of returning de back down to those levels. So you're right. I, I know we're staying on the topic of TA, but still, it's kind of gross. It's kind of gross to me how uh, beat down this, this stock has gotten. Well, you want to talk yeah, about I mean, gross? Baba, I think, is one of the only stocks that is lower than it was at the COVID drop. Right. It's almost back at, what's that, like 2017 levels? Um, uh... Early... In the 2018 point. 2019. Oh, 2019. Yeah. But so like the majority of stocks, as we know, you know, we had that massive COVID drop, um, brought stocks to almost the lowest low in, in many years. Yet, um, BABA is now significantly lower than it was during COVID. So even if you bought it at the very bottom of the COVID drop, you're negative on the position now. That's crazy to me. That's so crazy. Wow. I think it's one of the only stocks that if you purchased at the, uh, COVID lows, you'd actually be negative to date. Yeah, I wouldn't be. Uh, I wouldn't be holding my my shorts on Baba for sure. I think that <laughs> once, once we get down to this level, we're approaching two pretty strong support fractals. And uh, I mean, I, like, look at this. This is a, this is a textbook ABC corrective um, wave right here, as you can see. Wave A, wave B, wave C. So I mean, I, I would definitely not be holding my shorts for too much longer. Now I have a quick question. Let's say. We knew data up to the bottom or up to that A wave. Okay. Bottom of that A. If you were placing a short position, could you show us where your price targets would have been, assuming that's the only information we knew? Um, yeah. Absolutely. So these are going to be my two main profit taking tools. We will get to QS, I promise. <laughs> um, so my first profit target would have definitely been around this level. And then my second one would actually be right here, which would be a very extended price target around $140. So it maybe be taking out 75% of your position at that first level and letting the last 25% of the position That's run from there. Fantastic option. Fantastic okay. option. Yeah. I just think it's interesting to see, you know, even with that, only that data that we have, because I noticed that you're, it's the 272 and then the 618 level that you really use for those profit levels. Um, and that's exactly basically where we're hitting right now. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Look how we bounced off of that first profit zone. You know, we yeah, hit pretty perfectly. Came down. Yeah. 
Now, after you hit that first profit zone um, and take out, let's say you take out three fourths of your whole position, how do you? How would you manage that last quarter of your position? Would you up your stop loss to the entry so that it ends up either you know being free there or uh, you know because like after we touched that profit zone, we did see that bounce that we were just talking about. Who knows if we had continued moving higher? How would you have managed that? last bit of your position in that case yeah that's a great question actually um so i mean to begin we probably have to look at what would start the entry so let's just say that you know we saw that this retraced to the 50 maybe 61.8 uh probably 50 50 level of the fibonacci retracement let's just take a look to confirm that oh no we got to the 61.8 great so we got to the 61.8 and we broke down below this support line so that, let's just say this was my entry stop loss would go above this high and then my profit target would be right there. If we hit my profit target and we hit, pulled out 75% of the initial position, I would then move my st um, stop loss, not to just be uh, at break even, but actually to this high right here. Because if we then made a higher high, you know, we, we invalidated this level, then my trade would be invalidated. So either way, I'm pulling out with 75% profits and the profit locked in from this level at this high. Yep. Okay. Sounds good. So any other tickers? I know we were going to look at QS. I promise you we will. Yeah, go to QS real quick, and then we'll give some people some time. Make sure to send some any other tickers you want to take a look at into live chat VC mute. Um, and uh, please, you know, react to any others that you see. Yeah, if there please are react. So we can take a look at them as well. Because um, some people mentioned like Cardano, Palantir, PayPal. So if you guys want to see any of them, Scroll up, react to some of them, and uh, I'll let Logan know. So just off the bat, I do see that we have a Elliott Wave count, a five wave motive move higher. And just off the bat, we are obviously able to see this ABC corrective wave, right? So if we want to break this down and measure, because this is a zigzag for anybody who's unaware, but essentially what that means is that we have a five wave move in our C wave. Now, it does appear that we've completed a five wave move in our C wave already. So let's measure to see our profit zones. So we're not, I wouldn't say that we're just about there, but let's take one more confluence. We are very close to oversold, and it seems like we have a triple touch divergence line. We do. We have a wow. We have a quadruple touch divergence line. Okay, so I'm definitely going to be bullish on this. <laughs> um, so let's bring that back. I would say my final area where I would be looking for fantastic entries would be this level right here. This fib cluster right here would be if you if we get down here, I would I would definitely be buying, uh, taking some long positions. Calls. Now, if we hit that level, would you then place your stop loss at that 1618? Um, I know you just removed it, but that was a little bit lower. Or where would you set your stop loss in this scenario? Well, obviously, it wouldn't just be like I would wait for price to reach that point and then place an entry because I would drop to a lower time frame to find a actionable trade pattern or trade setup. But a, um, so in that situation, I would then place the stop loss beneath the low of that trade setup. But in this example, yes, that is a definitely a feasible opportunity is placing the stop loss beneath this point because if we break out of, wow, what happened to my stop loss here? Okay. That's never happened before. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that was. Um, but yes, we could definitely place a stop loss beneath this level right here if you did take a buy entry. Because at that point, if we broke beneath this, the only thing I would worry about is wicks because you might get wicked out. Like, let's just say we, we move down here. Price moves up, you enter, price wicks down lower and then moves higher. So what would be ideal is this. Maybe look at a short-term entry on a lower time frame around this level, place your stop loss below an actionable trade setup. And then once we get breaking above this resistance line, add another entry or a half of an entry here and a half of an entry here. Okay. Now let's see, same thing we did on the last stock. Let's say, again, we only had data up to the B move. 
let's try drawing some fibs there to see possible um, if you were entering a short position possible take profit levels and see where we're at relative to those um, for now so oh. okay in, if, in, in this example actually we reached the low so this would be the profit zone of that trade if we took that trade hypothetically. Mm -hmm. That'd be so, your second profit zone. Would your first one be at the 272 and the 618? That, that little zone? Yeah, yeah um, most likely. I would probably start taking profits out at this level. Yep. Like right here. Yeah. Yeah, most likely. And then um, price would get down here. So I would say anywhere from here just delete this so it's a little bit clearer to see. Anywhere from here to here, for my, my friend who wanted QS, I would say that this is a fantastic buying opportunity on here. Mm -hmm. in, this, in this blue zone. And then lastly, when you have those buy zones or sell zones, obviously it's a zone, not a level. So how do you determine the how much of your position you put in and where within that zone you would do so. For example, let's say you're entering the long position here. We have now basically touched the top of that zone. I'm sure you yeah. wouldn't enter a full position or a full size long position here. Um, how would you manage that, whether it's when entering trades or exiting trades, if you have zones like that that are fairly wide? Yeah, so what I would do is exactly what I was saying before. I'd go to a lower time frame and try to find a actionable trade setup here. And then I would place half of a position here. And then my other half of a position would be placed once we get the breakout of this resistance line. Okay. In this downtrending price pattern. But again, that, that's also very subjective and in the moment, right? It's like you have to know other confluences to go along with that, right? This so. is the confluence, I would say. This higher time from analysis for me would be the confluence. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I was just acknowledging like fundamentals and stuff, but yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Especially when looking at this for sure. I think Cardano got some review. Uh, yeah. Cardano and then Amazon too, but let's look at Cardano first, but just to stay on QS for a second, real quick, the uh, company that I was working for, for the last six months, the CEO of the company had a, huge position in QS um, and bought it near the COVID lows um, or actually not in the COVID lows, but back, you know, when it was down bad last year um, and he was up, I think over like 200 or $250 million on the position, but he had a lockout period due to, um, you know, ethics and, and codes, stuff like that within the company. So he wasn't able to sell and uh, you know, he hit his max profit at the top of that uh, fifth wave you know, back at the beginning of the year, but wasn't able to sell, ended up having to wait until about April to sell out his position. And uh, he still made profits, but he lost out on, I think in the call, he said over a hundred million dollars in, in profits that he saw disappear solely because of uh, codes of ethics and stuff like that within the trade. He had to hold it for a certain amount of time before exiting. So just a funny story. Well, I thought good thing he's not holding right now. Yep. No, I, I believe he's fully out of quantum scape, but uh, I do remember him talking about it in one of the company-wide calls, which, you know, kind of had me dying, but... Maybe you should tell him OBR is bullish. Maybe he'll get that. <laughs> um, yeah, so let's do one more TA request, please. So let, uh, we can do a Cardano, but let's just give it one more second. Everybody, please vote on what you would like to do. If anybody has another request, I just want to have some time for questions as well. LCID. Any, everybody, please, let's get some votes. Scrolling up, I still, it looks like um, Cardano is the most reacted right, to Cardano. so far. Two ideas. But yeah, everyone, please go up and vote. Um, yeah. We have to zoom out. Cardano has been absolutely killing it, so... And Logan, I don't know if you want to do this TA from scratch, um, right? That's what, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I just have this. Yep, yep, right go here. ahead. In. Um, so just everybody, please reference. This spike did not happen. I'm looking at a Kraken chart. 
if you guys don't know what he's talking about, Kraken is a uh, crypto exchange that uh, has some funky price movement sometimes. Yeah, I mean, on the 22nd of February, we had this weird spike on every single pair. Yeah, ETH, yeah, yeah. Um, so the thing about Cardano is that it actually could have retraced a little bit more than it did. As we all know, this has been, I, I think, the outperforming main altcoin so far since we had this like, couple of bearish months. But it's performing exceptionally well. As we know, it, it just broke above its prior highs um, and is now bouncing around that level. And we can see a lot of altcoins with this similar uh, pattern as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Especially the ones that have not been able to retrace as much and have just been moving up. So right. yeah, totally. this is a great example. The thing about Cardano is because it, it's performing so exceptionally well that it's, it's actually harder to chart when it performs so well. That being said, we can look at it in a lower time frame. And as you can see, we have a th five wave count. So to be expecting a corrective move after this push that we just had, especially the fact that we bounced off of this high, it's not out of the picture. I am slightly bearish, mainly bearish on Cardano. It, it, it could be a double top. Yeah, it definitely could come down. And, and, you know, anytime something runs like this, you can only imagine there has to be some sort of corrective wave to, to follow, right? It's not going to just continue this pace. So, yeah, it's actually, so this is something that not a lot of people know. Um, a double top is not actually just a zone where price confirms. So in a, in a double top, this is what people usually mean when they see a double top. And then a move lower. Not only does there have to be a rejection of this prior high, but there also has to be RSI divergence. That's a requirement. So in this example, it's actually not a double top, only because of the fact it might be on a higher time frame. Yeah, yeah. Go look at a higher time frame and see if you could find it. Okay, so on the daily, it is. On the daily. Yeah. Yeah. On the four hour, it's not. But the right. daily is definitely more prevalent in this situation. Yeah. So, see, is it? No. Yeah. I, I, well, yes, it is. I, I guess you could look at it a few different ways, but more or less it is. Yeah. Yeah, so that is just something to note that um, double tops and double bottoms, as well as triple tops and triple bottoms, do require RSI divergence. So in this example, I am pretty bearish on Cardano. The only thing that would change my mind is a break and a retest. So we break above this zone after we just had that huge indecision candle on the daily and then a push higher. And that but, would just tell you that the fifth wave hasn't finished yet, right? The fifth wave could go ex exactly. much higher. Yeah, yeah. Let's actually just measure that out. So we did not reach any fifth wave targets yet. We're just running into prior resistance where we got rejected. Yeah, from but we are close to two it is. Mid clusters. We so, were close, very close. And where does that put us around? Was that what, what's the price target around? Dollar seventy-two. Yep, yep. And then our extended take profit, which is is very extended, would be three dollars and forty-five cents. Yeah. That being said, uh, that's exactly what we're going to be looking for. Is is, is in the short to medium term, um, ADA coming lower, but it definitely could. This indecision candle says that we're going to probably come lower, but if we do get a break and a retest and then a move higher, these are our profit levels right here, just in case. So first zone would be set at $2.68. Second zone would be at $3.31. So let's say you placed a long position in Cardano. I have, I have two questions, but we'll go over this one first. Uh, Let's say you placed a long position in Cardano and you had these two zones as your take profit zone. How would you then factor in the possibility of a double top? Would you look at it and go, I get okay, out. I see the possibility of a double top. If I see these indecision candles, I'm just going to exit the position and take the profits I have. Or would you let it ride um, on just for however long it takes until we do hit those profit targets? Yeah, that's a great question. So it, it does come down to where our entry was, first of all, right? Either way, if you were taking this trade based off of any actionable trade setup, let's say you were not just blindly entering the market, then you're in profit. And my initial reaction and what has always worked for me throughout my many years of trading is react, well, monitor, first of all, what the market is giving you and then properly react in accordance to what that is. What the market is giving us right now is that there is a probable double top. So I, being in profits, would, if I was trading this, right, not if I'm holding this for the long term, if I'm trading this, I would take my profits now because we're in profit and there is something in the market which is showing us that a reversal is probable. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, completely. And then just to reiterate to everyone watching or listening, um, Logan just said it, but this is for trading, not for holding. For all the Cardano that I'm holding, Austin and you as well, Logan, not touching that, not selling out of that. That's that's being held. But we're talking about if you were strictly trading. Right. We're looking on a four hour chart right now. Yep. Right. So the second question I had had to do with your one and two waves on this impulse. Um, could you explain why you would put the one and two there? Uh, I understand the one, but I think that there may be some questions about the two since we didn't necessarily see a uh, lower low. Whereas, you know, there's this other wick a little bit earlier on that could possibly be argued as yeah. the end of the one and two. Yes, down there. I'll tell you why. Because if we're looking at this in a broad term of account, right? This is looking at this as one count. This right here, this retracement is not nearly the same size as this one when looking at the size of this one. This is the large, like the second largest correction that we could find, despite this one. Does that make sense? This one is not too large of a correction. And I mean, like in this one, in wave two that I have, there is an ABC corrective wave. Let's see. In yours. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, there is a hold on, I'll just label it for everybody. A B C. And then in this one, it like it's not even an ABC correction because we don't even reach the low of wave A. If we yeah. so just for everybody's knowledge, there's a there's two types of ABC corrections, right? There's a a, B, C, which we've seen the most of, and this is referred to as a zigzag. And we don't need to go into the exact rules because that's a whole talk. But there's also an A, a B, and a C. Actually, I drew that incorrectly. Let me do it for the same for you guys. So uh, A, B, C. This is what is, oh, okay. This is what is known as a flat correction. So in this case, it would be A, B, C. But in this example, this is not a flat correction because we do not reach the low of wave A. We, so we can draw it right here. As you can see, wave C does not reach the low of wave A, so it's not a flat correction. So this is not a complete ABC corrective wave. That's, that, that would be why it's not wave two. Yeah. Cool. So I think that that was a good amount of TA for right now. If anybody has any questions on that, we can definitely go into that. But we're also going to open this up to any general questions regarding any bit of TA you have. So um, if Brian, Bilou, if there's any way you could get some people to be able to talk, that would be ideal. If not, please type in uh, live VC chat for your questions. Yeah, we're just going to keep it in live VC uh, mute chat because it would be... Okay. Um, I Everybody mean, would be able to, right? Yeah, exactly. Got it. Okay, uh, so we ask that you please have your question. Sorry for the inconvenience. But Freeman says, quick question, how do analysts decide on their weekly watch list? Just curious. We can each go into answering this. I'll answer first. Yep. My weekly watch list is always determined on the highest probability setups that I'm seeing. So I'll go through my entire watch list right here. This I'm mainly a Forex trader, but I also do cryptocurrencies and I also do some equity plays as well. So this is just going to be a Forex watch list. Uh, you guys can see this, right? It's not just the chart. Perfect. So I go through my entire watch list all the way down, all of my cryptos, all of my stocks, and I'll even go into uh, Jacob's watch list, which he sent me, which is the ETF's watch list, and I'll go through all of these. And then my watch list is just comprised of the highest probability setups that I can find. I don't like to include any subpar setups. Yeah, so then I can get, I guess I can go over my way too. So... Um, as far as, you know, since I'm strictly trading equities and we don't necessarily have um, price data for weekends and stuff like that, like you may have on um, Forex pairs or uh, cryptocurrency. Not, not on Forex, just on crypto. Yeah, the main thing that I do um, when looking at my watch list is I pay attention to sort of, well, there are a few things I look at. First of all, it's possible big uh, macro moves that we may see. This, you know, the, the main example of this could be earnings reports. So during earnings season, which is, you know, coming to a close now, um, I'll look at the earnings that are coming up for the next week. I'll look at all of the charts for those possible companies and see if I, you know, if there are any that I recognize that are large movers on earnings. Um, take a look at their chart, see if there are any possible TA setups. Um, once again, you know, those are coin flips, but this is just solely for earnings. Um, you, uh, I, I take a look at those, look at some prehistoric moves um, and you know, compare that sort of to where it's at right now and gauge kind of if I have any hypothesis on where they're going to go. So that's strictly for earnings. 
Um, the majority of the way that I actually come up with my watch list is just through paying it or reviewing stocks that we were paying attention to during the week. So, you know, I haven't completed my watch list for this week. It'll be out tomorrow, um, tomorrow afternoon. But one of the main stocks that's going to be on my watch list is Apple. Uh, we saw Apple had its, you know, kind of failed breakout out of the pennant earlier this week um, and come back to retest back inside that level. And we went over it a little bit earlier in this call too. So that's a trade where I know that it's nearing the end of this pennant. There's a possible large move in the cards for it. So I'll look at it, do some TA, pick on a direction, and then make my decision there. Um, additionally, uh, SPY is generally always on my, on my watch list because it's sort of the, the one stock that I pay attention to 100% of the time. You always want to be um, aware of what's going on in the overall market. So, you know, for, for uh, this week, I noticed that we were at the top of our channel or going into last week, actually, I noticed we were at the top of our channel and there was a possibility of us coming back to retest the bottom. So I paid attention to that, looked at some news, always pay attention to um, FOMC meetings or any other important uh, economic data coming out and make my ideas based on that. You know, if we have a large news week coming up and the S&P is trading somewhere uh, at some key levels, such as, you know, the top of our channels, then, you know, I have the possibility of deciding we, we could see news coming out for a big move this week. We are fairly overextended. I expect that we're going to see a drop this week. So it's sort of a uh, convergence of both possible news coming out during that week and other charting setups that we've either gone over in live call um, or just that I've seen throughout the week. Almost every time that someone brings up a stock in live call that I notice something um, fairly attractive. If I see a nice setup or something starting to form, I write that down and revisit it over the weekend to see um, what happens. So it's the same thing as Logan, just going over my entire watch list and possibly some other stocks we went over during the week to uh, keep up to date and see any possible moves on those. Yeah, same for me. I go over, over my entire watch list as well. And I look over the stocks that we've been talking about all week. Um, like with Logan said, the highest probability setups, yes. And then stock chat, what we've been talking about, what other analysts are talking about too. I consult the other analysts. I look at their watch lists as well if they post it before I do. But just that's like from a technical standpoint, just outside of that, it's also like market knowledge, knowing how something may move with another. So a specific example is like Mar and Riot with Bitcoin. You know, if crypto is pumping, you know, it might not be a bad idea to, to keep your eye out on to keep your eye on uh, Mara and Riot as well. So there are technical ways to look at it, which is majority of what I do for my watches, but there are also specific cases such as those. I can't think of any more examples, but those are just like, I guess you would call them like fundamental uh, strategies, right? Yeah, you're you're mixing together. Um, oh, can you hear me? Yeah, you're mixing together your, your confluences, right? Your, your fundamentals and your technicals, right? And that helps you come to a, uh, a conclusion for the week ahead, right? And I think we yeah. all kind of have that similar that similar kind of strategy, right? Um, often, I, I often utilize, right? Uh, I utilize Twitter big time to help me find equities to, that maybe perhaps could uh, have something interested in, interesting in, in them. Uh, a lot of our analysts obviously use Flow Algo, right? Uh, Cheddar Flow, a lot of these, um, you know, stuff to give them tr trade ideas, right? So there's a ton of ways to get ideas for a trade and, and develop to develop a watch list, right? It's it's a very, um, it's it's subjective. There's no specific way to go about it. Yeah, and just to add on a little bit about the, you know, Mara, Mara Riot, Coinbase, um, those kind of crypto trades, I, I actually, I'm, I'm really glad you, glad you brought those up, Ryan, because for me, at least, they have been on my watch list for the last couple of weeks. Um, and normally, they're not stocks that I expect to see on my watch list. But this is sort of one of the reasons why I, I wait until Sunday, um, because Bitcoin and these cryptocurrencies can move over the weekend. And so if we see a large move in Bitcoin over the weekend, I'll almost always add one of those stocks to my watch list just because, you know, the, the difference between equ equities and, and crypto is that equities only trade on weekdays, whereas crypto trades over the weekend as well. So if, you know, Bitcoin consolidates over the weekend, you don't really see any moves. I won't really pay attention to those stocks during the week. But if crypto made a big move in either direction over the weekend, those stocks then have to adjust on Monday. So you can normally get some insane day trades on uh, you know, Coinbase, Riot, Mara. If Bitcoin pumped, those stocks are gonna pump a fairly significant amount or you know, vice versa, Bitcoin dropped hard over the weekend. 
those stocks are still at the price they closed at on Friday, they need to adjust for those moves in crypto over the weekend. So those are stocks that I really wait until the last minute to add to my watch list in case there are any moves on crypto. Yeah. And another thing, right, we mentioned how stuff relates to each other, right? Um, I don't know. Every time we're in live call, I go, obviously, this past week, I haven't been because I was sitting on a beach. But um, obviously, when we look at the, the market, we often see finance and big tech flip, flip flop, right? So uh, that's just another one that, that you could observe, right? You're like, oh, okay, uh, the banks are red today. So I think that there might be a chance I'm going to keep my eye out on Microsoft and Apple. You know what I mean? That's just another one of the things that's kind of like on that same wavelength of looking at Bitcoin and crypto related equities. Cool. So moving into our next question, Houston or Huston says, can you go over the values you use in the Fibonacci retracement and Fib extension? I had a different TP zone on NVIDIA from when Logan was doing it and wondering if my values are set up differently. Absolutely. I do have mine uh, all custom set up. So you most likely did have them differently, but I'll just pause here for a second so you can see. And something important is that you press this down here. This is most likely why we actually have different ones. Fib levels based on a log scale. I'm using log scales on pretty much all of my charts, as you can see right down here. So that's most likely why it was different. But here are again the numbers. And the colors. You wanna open up your NVIDIA chart because I think we went over it. So you may still have that TA up um, so he can just take a look too and compare. Yep. Yeah. Um, and, and Logan, I don't know if you talked about uh, perhaps maybe mentioning just like, you know, why you use a logarithmic uh, instead of a rhythmic, rhythmic um, arithmetic. I genuinely just find that it works better on most charts um, because I noticed that when I was starting to chart cryptocurrencies, my Fibonacci tools were not properly working, but then yeah. I just turned them on to log and now they work on every chart. So that's the, honestly the only reason why. A lot of a lot of the yeah a lot of the manual TA um, that's done right like Fibonacci and um, I don't know if you know about Wolf Waves or, or what, whatever they're called um, a lot of that stuff does rely on a logarithmic scale um, but if you guys don't know the, know the difference between a logarithmic scale and like a regular scale like a, 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 a rhythmic I believe how you say it is that a logarithmic is just pretty much the uh, the uh, y axis is uh, exponential um, that's the only difference. Yeah, so, um, and I have a, a an anecdote with this. Um, Austin, when we first met, <laughs> yeah. did all my trading, and for, for a long time, I did all my trading with uh, linear scales or arithmetic scales, whatever you want to call them. Um, and those, those worked out fairly well for me. But then when Austin and I would be in, you know, private calls and stuff, talking about stocks or, or crypto or just looking at possible setups, we, there were consistently these times where, let's say, you know, NVIDIA right here. Um, I don't necessarily know if this will play out, but if you switch it from a log to a, a linear chart, in some cases, that top breakout line that we drew, the trend line, may actually indicate on one chart a breakout and on another chart, not actually a breakout quite yet. And so for about two months, actually, I ended up charting almost everything on both log and linear scales, just sort of to see the differences, see how... Um, if either of them worked out a bit better and you know that was back in february march since then i have solely used log charts um so you know just a funny little anecdote for me um i uh i've completely switched over to log charts because i have found that they somehow just showcase price action a little bit better and can be a little bit more accurate there were times when you know a stock we thought was breaking out awesome to be like yep it broke out and i'd be like oh no i need to wait a little bit Sure well, enough, we, we, yeah. we can um, never find the actual like there's no actual like benefit or um uh downside to like utilizing either or right there in i guess you could say right logarithmic is better because that's what i think but from a technical standpoint from an objective standpoint you can use anything you want but it's just good to know right uh, a lot of people new traders especially yeah. they come on they don't even know that a logarithmic scale exists right so they're just using what trading view gives them or what thinkorswim gives them definitely utilize a logarithmic scale if you have never done that before it'll yeah. probably change your perspectives on a lot of things yeah so at the end of the day like you know if you draw this pennant pattern on nvidia it's going to look almost exactly the same on a log versus linear chart however like the exact breakout level may be slightly different but, you know, if you see it break up past 
this trend line on either chart, it's, it's going to continue moving higher just because that's how the price action works. So there's no real, you know, drawback there. The, uh, the trend lines you draw are almost, almost the same. There are only very slight differences, but I agree with Logan. The biggest difference that I noticed was actually in, uh, the Fibonacci tools. Make sure that you switch them to log scale. If you're using log as Logan showed, um, where you right click them. I'll show you guys why it's, it makes a difference. Yeah, yeah, show us an example. So here's Cardano with log enabled on the Fibonacci tools. Now, let's remove it. And as you can see, the levels are completely different. The, uh, Fib the uh, golden ratio zone is much smaller and much misplaced. As you can see, the 236 should not be this high. And then when you switch it back to uh, the log, Everything looks better. Everything gets fixed, especially on cryptos. But it does it yeah. does everything. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't want to do much on this question. If you want to just give one final thought, Jacob. Yeah. No. The the last thing I was just going to say is that you can use whichever one works better for you. For a long time, I used linear charts. Worked perfectly well for me. It was only after a couple months of testing the log charts that I decided to switch over. Um, and now that's just what I use for everything. So really no significant significant differences but it's whatever you find works out better for your trading style right just like i sometimes use line charts instead of candlestick charts it's just personal preference um so maddie basis says how do you get the fibonacci lines and other tools to appear on your charts everything that is on trading view is manually drawn um, I have this little handy toolbar. I know Austin has a secret hate for toolbars for some reason in TradingView. But if you just go to a tool that you use, you can star it right here. And then it gets added to your screen. It's very easy. Just click, drag, whatever you need to do. All of it's manually added. YK Cool. Oh, sorry. I skipped one. Osbin19 says, can I get an understanding on where you begin your trend lines on the chart on a certain high or low or where? I mean, it really depends on the wave that we're in. I only draw mine on the current wave. So I know, or, or if it's still prevalent, obviously. So find a good example right here. I would start mine at this low and then I would draw higher. In this example, I think this low is actually news driven, but it also depends on what has the highest confluence, meaning the most touches. So this one is probably what I would actually utilize because we have a low right here, this wick. Um, and then as you can see, we have bounced off two times or three times, sorry, instead of two. In this example, I would start at the low like that. And then in, let's look at a bullish example. In this example, just say right here, just as an example, I would connect these highs. And then in this example, I would connect these highs. Basically looking for whatever has the most confluence in your wave that you're currently looking at is, is the best way to put it, I think. Notes from any analysts on that? No, not really. Um, yeah, not really. It, it For me, when I'm drawing my trend lines, it, it's basically the same thing. Um, just look for sort of the most significant ones. Um, that stick. There are certain cases where I know like Austin and I will draw slightly different trend lines, but almost 90% of the time we have the exact same ones drawn. Um, the difference might just be a wick versus a close or um, slight different angle. But the majority of the time, um, it's sort of the most significant trend that I see building. Um, and then I stick to that for as long as it seems significant until it's broken or, or something else shows itself that's a little bit better. Yeah, it yeah. just depends on your trading style. If you're going longer term, you might want to go farther back to start your trend lines. If you're just scalping, not always necessary. That's a great point. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, Blue. It's it, it's all about trading style, right? And everyone will find their trading style as they do it more, right? You know, yeah, you don't have to do everything. Time frame for sure. Hundred percent. Time frame is huge, right? That's gonna yeah. Like if oh, you're yeah, you're yeah. Sure. Sure. do you want to it's show like here. Bitcoin or something, and then show the log versus? Well, that is. Well, that's the that's the ultimate example. Yeah. In terms of fibs, in this example, or right, well, you can in just terms do of anything. Zooming out for five years and showing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it's unreadable. What it looks like when you don't have log on. This is Bitcoin on a linear chart. Yeah. Which is look how look how bad that looks, right? So if you're doing everything through a, a linear scale, that correction down to twenty eight k looked like the end. 
Right. It just it just looked like the end, and then you clear up the, now, the the air, and you see the true price action in comparison to the entire you know uh, life cycle of the asset, and you can see what our correction did is one hundred percent normal, right? So you know, it, yeah. So <laughs> just to put it into yeah. perspective, that big drop that went like this is this right here. This right here. So flip flip back and forth, Logan. This. Yeah. This whole drop right here is this right here. Yeah. And it doesn't look too bad. It looks it doesn't look too different when you're kind of zoomed in, you switch back and forth, but definitely when you're looking on, on higher time frames, it, it can get intense. I guess yeah. you are looking at a higher time frame. Well, yeah, that was sort of the other reason why I ended up switching. I figured, you know, log works on every chart very, very well, whereas linear works, you know, pretty well on stocks, but sometimes going over to uh Forex pairs or crypto, especially that's when you can see those issues. Linear scales struggle with volatility. Yeah, yeah. So the another, yeah. So something you know with log is that linear shows the exact price change to to the dollar and compares it to the exact dollar it was before, whereas the log scale will show it in more so percentages. So when you're thinking about like or not percentages, but moves relative to other moves. So you'll see that, you know, Bitcoin going from 40K to 60K is a huge move in dollar amounts. But in terms of percentages and stuff like that, it's very, very similar to some of the other moves that we saw historically with Bitcoin. So it's not as significant of a move as you may expect. And that's something you'd only be able to tell by looking at a log chart. So that's another reason why I switched. Cool. So let's go to our next question. Um, why cool says after the fifth wave, I probably just butchered your name. I apologize. Lucky. Um, okay. Read it backwards. Oh, okay. Lucky backwards. Got it. Um, after the fifth wave, the ABC correction should not be lower than the low of the fourth wave. That is, I'm not exactly sure where you heard that. That is not a guideline. Um, it can go technically as low as the first wave. Yeah, I think that when we've talked about it, we always use the first wave as sort of the furthest that, it, that the ABC can go down. So, yeah, if you want to draw that real quick. Like, just normally, we won't see correction. Like, this is what you'll no normally see, something like this. But if you see something that goes like this, well, probably not like that, but it would be like this, A, B, C. Like, that, that would not be weird at all. Like, that's, that's completely fine. Okay, so let's move into Spazin. says, might have missed it, but could Logan or Austin speak on their thoughts on Bitcoin dominance and see if, and if he sees altcoins slowing down or will they keep going? Um, I was just talking about this yesterday and I did pull up the chart actually, pull it back up. I know Austin could probably give you a lecture, but I'll give you my quick two points really fast and let him go on it. Um, I do think that either way, we're heading lower on Bitcoin dominance and alt seasons will continue, which is weird to believe because I think that we are extended pretty far on most altcoins. So I'm starting to get a little contrary, but I, this chart pattern just seems very clear to me on Bitcoin dominance. I think that either we're going to head lower now or we have a slight pullback before we head lower. But I do think that Bitcoin dominance will continue to fall. I, I agree. Um, okay, I'm not muted. Yeah, no, Bitcoin dominance, right? It looks like it's going to continue to fall. And that's a clear indication that altcoins are going to continue pumping, right? Because money is leaving Bitcoin um, and going elsewhere into the market, the cryptocurrency market. And there's only, right, if you're not Bitcoin, then you're an altcoin. So the money's going into altcoins. Um, and Logan, I, I, I see where you're coming from, right? You're like, okay, things have pumped, right? I, how could these things continue to pump more? I will say this. Uh, there are a lot of major altcoins that we have not seen big moves from, right? And I will give you some examples of that right now. Uh, BNB has not made any fairly significant, very extremely significant moves. Polkadot is still lagging behind, in my opinion. We have not seen any major moves from Chainlink, Litecoin. Um, let's see here. No. Um, of course, Nano, right? That's even a smaller cap, but I'm just paying attention to some of these larger cap coins who have really yet to move. Ave has yet to make a big move, right? So I'm really expect expecting some of these uh, these DeFi, DeFi coins, uh, some of these larger cap DeFi coins to start making some moves here soon. Because um, you, you can kind of see this, uh, 
well, I guess, right, DeFi wouldn't be a good example, right, because Solana is DeFi, but there's this certain section of altcoins that are pumping right now, right? It's not the typical set of altcoins that we're used to. So, um, you know, if, if we do continue to see Bit Bitcoin dominance go down, then perhaps we'll see some of these altcoins pop off. Uh, and, and just think about it like popcorn, though, right? It's not like, I wouldn't be thinking about the this the short term, right, the next month or so with what altcoins is doing to be like, um, to, to set like a major trend necessarily, they're just sort of popping here and there. And you want to be able to catch them when they pop and maybe sell for profit. Um, personally, I don't do that because I don't want to be uh, taken advantage of with short ca uh, short term capital gains, right? So I hold my crypto for well over a year so I can get taxed less when I go to sell. Um, but you know, it, it's just kind of like popcorn. I hope you guys like that analogy, right? When Bitcoin dominance is falling, there's an alt season upon us. You're just going to see some of them just start to pop. You know, and uh, whenever they happen, they happen. We saw a big pop, obviously, from Solana. I don't know. Uh, Logan, you should take a look at the Solana chart while you have it up. Um, we also took, uh, we saw major moves from XRP. We saw big moves from Audius, right? I'm, I'm a big audio guy. It's a lower market cap coin. If you're familiar with OBR and our live calls, you've definitely heard me talk about it. But yeah, this is amazing right here. This is a Solana chart. And this is, I believe, one of the only altcoins, right? Some major altcoins, right? You could obviously name other ones that have made all-time highs during this time. But this is one of the only major altcoins that have really blown past all-time highs during this this period right so pretty amazing um and this is a very similar pattern what was the we were looking at xrp that's right xrp in you know solana like a lot of these cryptocurrencies a lot of these altcoins have very similar patterns so um you know wouldn't be su wouldn't be surprising for me to see some of the other more dormant ones start to make some move like i said bnb ltc uh ave stuff like that so what about if you have nothing else to add on that what about your thoughts on ethereum being altcoin slash market mover etc yeah so that's a that's subjective i don't know what logan thinks about that i don't i don't consider um ethereum an altcoin anymore um i don't know logan what do you what do you think about that i mean we'd, we'd have to define altcoin i think it's it's definitely the one of, like it's obviously the second largest coin so i i would not cl like count it as an altcoin but i know some people do because some people think anything besides bitcoin is an altcoin well that's like the that's like the that's the definition that's the original definition but obviously times are changing but i'm sorry jacob what was your question again i, I like i feel like i grazed yeah. over it well the so spaz and asked and said ETH isn't really considered an altcoin or is okay. it more of a large cap coin it's more it's more of a large cap coin, right? So that's like one of those things that there's not a clear line. It's it's the lines kind of blurry on that one. It's um I'm sure what well, obviously I, I personally believe Ethereum I know this is a TA class, I'm sorry, but I personally believe Ethereum it will overtake Bitcoin in market cap. So, you know, if that's the definitions we're gonna go by, then Bitcoin um will soon be an altcoin. So Yeah, but for now, at least as long as Bitcoin is the a the highest uh market cap. Yeah. That's the only thing. Market cap is the only significant thing. Yeah, All yeah, the other exactly. numbers are irrelevant. Bitcoin is by far the largest cryptocurrency. Not so by that's far. Really gonna yeah, maybe not by far relative, but it, yeah, yeah. On, on a linear yeah. chart by far, dollar wise, market cap. But yeah. Um, for as long as that's at the top, I think that's still gonna be the the main coin that we look at for sort of total market moves. I think Bitcoin is sort of in the same spot as like let's say the s p when you're looking at overall market moves you know that's sort of your reference point yeah yeah it's tough it's tough you gotta if you're looking for what altcoins are gonna do right it's like do you do you look at eth or do you look at bitcoin well you look at both that's what i would tell you to do um you, you look at the price action of both and you should also utilize your um your totals right your your total market cap chart which um you can go and find uh you should just be able to go on trading view. Logan, you might can you do this live for me on, on the thing? Uh, just type in total and show people how they could find that. Um, if they're ever curious, it should. And then you go to crypto. Um, you actually have to go to uh, all for some oh, reason. It doesn't actually oh, come. Okay. Up. Okay. Yeah. It, I mean, it's always a pain in the ass. Yeah. Definitely add this to your watch list, guys. And then there's also Logan. Go to total two. Total two is the total right. altcoin market cap. So it's the entire cryptocurrency mark coin, market cap, excluding Bitcoin. Right. So. Um, that's and it's fairly similar, right? But you know, looking at having these things to your to your disposal is really good too. I also utilize ETH D ETH dominance. Um, uh, and also another thing, sorry to go on with the crypto guys, but um, definitely utilize pairs, right? So I look at ETH ADA or ADA ETH. I look at um, I look at I compare a lot of altcoins to ETH. Um, and that's how you know you're going to pump, right? So if you look at an ADA ETH chart right now, ADA is just gaining an intense amount of value against Ethereum, right? So you can do a bunch of stuff like that to, you know, do it up. Yeah, and another thing just quickly to mention, total 
So total one looks very, very similar to the Bitcoin chart, whereas total two looks very, looks very like similar to the Ethereum chart. Correct. So, Correct. you know, you can argue that Bitcoin is what you look for for the macro, you know, yeah. moves, yeah. macro trends. You know, if we're in a crypto bull market or crypto bear totally. market, totally. But then yep. you can look at total two or look at Ethereum to sort of decide um, what are the altcoins doing? What are the altcoins yeah. going to do? Because yeah, yeah, this is total two right here, but it looks almost exactly the same as the Ethereum right. um, chart does. It's more or less going to be because we still know that Ethereum kind of follows behind Bitcoin still, you know, in a in, when it comes to price action, right? If we see a big move from Bitcoin, typically we end up seeing that move from ETH and other altcoins as days go by. Um, so, you know, it's no surprise that they're different, but they, they do have their differences, uh, slight ones, but, you know, they're both, they're both very good tools. That's what yeah. that's all they are. They're just tools. So let's move into the next question. Um, yes. So Freeman asks, I know this topic is way too much for tonight, but maybe for next time we do something like this. Could you go over the analysts review on scanners, stock scanners, whether they use them and their approach to using them? Absolutely. I think the number one person to ask for this would actually be Andy. Um, if you could ask him in a live chat, I'm sure he'd be happy to break it down for you. I know Jacob also has some experience. Yeah. I'm sure everybody has some experience, but Andy's a killer with those. Yeah, so, I mean, this is a topic we can go more in depth later, but just sort of to answer it a little bit, um, I, it, it depends on your, um, your trading strategy. The majority of the time when people use scanners, they are scanning pre-market for large movers, and then they're day trading based on those pre-market moves. So the number one situation where I see people using scanners are if they're focusing on day trading, something like that. There's two other, two other things I want to go over real quick. For stock scanners themselves, something that I do sometimes is I have a very general stock scanner that I use actually on TradingView. You can set up a quick scanner um, and I can look for stocks that are above some of the key levels that I like to look at. Um, for example, I use the 200 EMA as a general trend line. Um, so if you're above the 200 EMA, generally in a bullish trend or below it in a bearish trend. So sometimes I may look for stocks that are above the 200 EMA and above like the 50 just so you know, I have an idea of what stocks may be on somewhat of a, of a bull trend if I want to look for long positions or vice versa for shorts. The third thing is option scanners. So the, the biggest option scanner that, that a lot of people use, like Austin has, is um, Flow Algo. So these are algorithms that actually pick out unusual options activity. You can set up your own scanners that find unusual options. One thing that I know Austin does, or Andy does, and that I did for a little bit of time, is you can set certain option Greek levels, um, volume and open interest levels on those options, and it can pick out options that fit your criteria that either show you know unusual activity or something like that. Not something I really use um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Andy uses it much more. And then, like I said, Austin uses Flow Algo as a completely separate type of option scanner. But uh, it's for me, I, I generally pick out my own options. I've had... Um, positive and negative experiences using those option screeners and solely trading based off of volume and stuff like that. So um, I don't really use them all the time, but that's up to personal preference. Yeah. But yeah, I, I think uh, in terms of scanners, Andy's really the only one who uses them. And I think it's just for options. Um, yeah. Cool. So moving into our last crypto question for the night, Spazin says, People like to believe ADA is the ETH killer. Can they both be successful in their own ways? I ask because similar to Austin, ETH and ADA are my two largest holdings. Austin, I'll let you start off with that one. Yeah, so they are they are same. My largest holding is Ethereum, and my second large, largest is Cardano. Um, and Cardano, as I said, is gaining a lot on ETH, so <laughs> maybe ADA will be my largest holding uh, in the future. Um, but you and said, they're can, they're both be, can they both be winners? Um, yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's a crazy thing to think about, right? It's like when we look at big tech, right? Uh, there isn't just one winner in big tech, right? There's big, there's a bunch of them, right? We have Apple, Microsoft, Google, right? Uh, oh, Netflix, Facebook. Yeah. So, I mean, there's going to be, there can't just be one thing that just runs the world, right? It's just like it, whenever there's a new technology of some kind, and you can use this example for social media too, right? It's not like Facebook runs off social media, you, you right? Facebook bought Instagram, but before, right? You had Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, uh, you got LinkedIn, all these other, you know, music, Spotify could be considered one, whatever, YouTube. Um, there's many different giants, right? So I, I do think that, uh, 
Cardano could be a giant along with Ethereum and have very similar market caps. But, but, I will say this. Um, the, the word ETH killer has been around for quite a while, right? Depending on how long you've been in cryptocurrency, you might have heard it or you might have not. But um, if any of you guys were around in 2017 during that bull run, they labeled many different cr coins as Ethereum killers, right? The biggest one, they, they kept on saying that Tron and EOS were going to kill Ethereum. And now all those coins are just in the absolute shitter, right? So it's like, I don't know, every single thing that gets labeled as an Ethereum killer, I get scared because usually they suffer, right? I don't know. Just you, you can't beat the mighty Ethereum, you know, it's just it, nothing's going to take it down in the short term. But yeah, Art Cardano and ETH can both be successful together. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Things will be run on either protocol, and I think that they will happily coexist. Or, and, yeah, and, you know, so, there's going to be more. There could be it, maybe Cardano doesn't win, and it's ETH and Solana. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, that's just kind of, it doesn't have to be Cardano, but Cardano is a great project. They're kind of running on promises, right? If you guys didn't know that, that's kind of a thing. It's a speculative project still. They are coming out with smart contracts soon. Did they do that yet? Did they come out with smart contracts? Yeah, they did. Yeah. They did. It's functioning right now. It's good to go. It's awesome. Good to go. Very good. Very good. I'm glad that they followed through with that. Yeah. I mean, so guys, if you have uh, any last minute questions for premium or trial members, send them in live chat, VC mute. Um, if you're a free member and we don't get any questions in live chat VC mute during this last minute or two, send them in free chat and we may be able to take a look at those. But I think we'll conclude here in a couple minutes um, if we've gone over most everything people want us to talk about. Let's try and keep it more TA related because um, we sort of segued off into crypto for a little while recently. But uh, yeah, if not, then, then we're probably going to conclude this session fairly soon. Um, I mean, I, I, have, I have something. I, I have a question for Logan, I suppose. Yeah. Um, are you familiar at all with Wolf Waves? No, I've never heard of that. You should do uh, your research. So I'm, I'm just looking into them. And guys, this is right. Um, we we all as analysts have our all of our specific styles and, and stuff that we know right under our belt. Um, but the world of technical analysis is huge, right? And there's quite literally probably hundreds of thousands of ways to determine where a uh, financial instrument is going to go, right? Um, so I have been looking into this other way of of of, of wave counts and they're called wolf waves and they're, they're a little different you should take a look into it uh logan i'm just I'm, I'm very much a novice when it comes to wolf waves but um you know they're they're very interesting um you know just another thing maybe for you guys to take a look at logan and i'm specifically directing that towards you i, I think you no, I'll take you're a like look you would yeah yeah anything with waves you, you, you seem I, to like, yeah you I seem to you like you must you must like the ocean logan i do you like waves something that i want to actually bring up from what you just said is I talk to probably 200 traders a day at, at the firm I work for, and each one of them has a different trading style. Technical analysis is very, is very individualistic. There's a lot of different ways to make money, and at OBR, we just share you what we know works for us. Um, that being said, there's plenty of other ways to find. And uh, if, if your personality fits one way better, I'm sure we have a, a way at OBR that we can help that fits your personality, but there's always other ways that lean more into your edge and help you capitalize more on the markets. Yep. Can people speak right now? No. They no, can't. can't. Uh, what he just says, for triangle patterns, do you guys have a special condition to know if it is going to go your way? Um, well, it depends on which the triangle pattern is set up in. If you which way it go, enters. Yeah, it, 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 yeah. If you go into... The OBR education section, we actually have, I have a whole section that I dedicated to triangles in one of the PDFs, but each different triangle pattern has a different direction. It's, it's important to categorize them into which direction they're meant to go. When you draw them, it's pretty easy to identify. So yeah, I mean, we, we can leave it at that, but go into the OBR education section. There's a whole triangle section. I'm sure it'll, uh, it'll help. Yeah. And sort of, you know, something I want to add on to that, because this is something that I just noticed, at least in my experience with trading. There are set patterns like that. For example, price is increasing, then you start to form that little flag or pennant and you'd expect it to go up from there. However, and I, I just say this because I've seen this multiple times, so you, I, I've had to adapt. I no longer bank on that happening. I no longer look at, um, I, I still consider that as sort of what it, you know, quote unquote should do. But if I have my pennant drawn and I see it break down out of the bottom of the pennant and have some confirmation candles, I'm not entering a long position. I'm not touching it because if it breaks down from that pattern, that can completely invalidate it. So I'm more so, at least when I look at these, is I look for, I, I'm fairly neutral on them, 
um, depending on where they're moving. If you look at it at a separate scale, let's say Logan, you have a uh, you have a wave count, and we're at like the fourth wave, so you're expecting to see a fifth wave in one direction. Um, then you could be more biased towards that directional move. But sort of like let's say for Apple, where it's at, although it sort of rose up and then formed this little pendant, so you may expect it to break out positive. I'm still staying fairly neutral there because you know we saw it try to break out once and then come back inside. Um, if it breaks down out of the bottom, then I'm not going to be looking to long it. Um, maybe not sure about shorts, but you know I'm a little bit more neutral at least with those types of patterns, just because I've seen it go either way. Although they theoretically have sort of set directions to them. Great note, thank you, Jacob. Yeah. Um, just in free chat, Tracer asked, "What's an impulse wave?" I, we're not gonna go over that for now. We went over that. That was basically the the bread and butter of this entire, you know, call. So I hey, recommend that you watch the re-uploaded version or take a look at our education section to learn about it more there. But we yep. did just go over it uh, many times. So here's a question for our technical specialist, Bilu. Will the recording be available to all? Members, uh, free members included, or just premium? That's an executive decision, so I'm not quite sure. Understood. I believe it's going to be open to everybody, but we will check up on that to make sure. I, cool. I believe this first one will. Well, on that note, if anybody has any last-minute questions, super last-minute, feel free to type it in, but I think we're going to wrap it up now. I really, really appreciate, uh, appreciate you guys coming out, especially on a Saturday night. Seriously, we appreciate it. We really hope you guys took some value out of this and some valuable insight that you can take and apply into your own trading. Um, I see Houston. Thank you. Thank you for joining, man. Everybody have a fantastic rest of your Sunday. I'm going to go hit the pool. Thank you again for joining. Really hope it helped. Thank, thanks for hosting, um, uh, Jacob and Logan. I appreciate that. Thanks for coming in, bro. You guys are some, you guys are some badass motherfuckers in here. <laughs> All right. Cool. Take it easy. Enjoy your Saturday night. Yeah, you guys too. Thanks.